Hello, I'm David Gauntlet from the University of Westminster. Here I am doing some talking and there I am with my son Finn who wrote most of this talk. This presentation is called Making is Connecting. I presented this at the London School of Economics in January 2010, at which point I'm about halfway through writing a book called Making is Connecting, so here are some of the arguments. If you happen to have seen my stuff before, you might expect that Making is Connecting would be all about Web 2.0, digital stuff, probably a bit of Lego in there, and therefore you might be surprised that it begins as a book with the words clip clock clang, clip clock clang. This is the sound of William Morris, age nine, trotting through Epping Forest in 1847, wearing toy armour on his horse, dreaming of the past but thinking about the future. Now, if we chart the development of creativity, that's everyday creativity up the left hand side there, and we've got the centuries, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th time going along the bottom up to the 21st century. One model of the development of everyday creativity basically goes like this. It trots along perfectly nicely, but then goes whoosh in the 21st century with the arrival of digital media. But another model of the development of everyday creativity goes more like this. Creativity is doing fine through most of the centuries, but takes a big plunge, as you saw there, in the 20th century. What's down there? That's television. The whoosh back up again is the promise, if you're willing to be optimistic, of digital media. Now, why do I say making is connecting? Well, I mean this in three key ways. Firstly, making is connecting because you have to put things together, materials, ideas, or both, to make something new. Secondly, making is connecting because acts of creativity usually involve, at some point, a social dimension and connecting us with other people. And thirdly, Making is connecting because through making things and sharing them in the world, we increase our engagement and connection with other people and with the world itself. Now, if you're assuming that this is the best model of the development of creativity, you may well use thinkers such as Charles Ledbetter and Clay Shirky. If we're using this model, which I am, then you can keep Ledbetter and Shirky, but also I would suggest that we could stir in thinkers such as Ivan Illich, the radical philosopher from the 1970s, or William Morris, the radical philosopher from the 1870s. And also it means we get to resurrect people like Neil Postman, who I used to think was a miserable curmudgeon that just didn't like popular culture. But nowadays I can see what his point was. People spending an average of four hours a day watching television, as they do on average more than four hours in the UK and in the US. They're not idiots, but it's such a lot of time that people are spending when they could be doing something more creative. It's just a lot of watching. The theme that unites these three thinkers is that they're interested in creativity and people making things for themselves rather than accepting mass-produced, less special things made by others. If you look at Shirky and Ledbetter, their main point relates to that, but it's slightly different. It's more like this. It's about the power of creative collaboration for social good and organisation of social life, but also for information and for business. It's fine, but it's not exactly my emphasis here. Now, to show in a little more detail how these older thinkers have something to say, if we're willing to be optimistic, about the potential of Web 2.0 and digital media, Ivan Illich, in an excellent quote from his 1973 book Tools for Conviviality, said this, Tools are intrinsic to social relationships. An individual relates himself in action to his society through the use of tools that he actively masters or by which he is passively acted upon. To the degree that he masters his tools, he can invest the world with his meaning. But to the degree that he is mastered by his tools, the shape of the tool determines his own self-image. So on the one hand, if you master your tools, you can stamp meaning on the world. And obviously there I think of digital media, Web 2.0. To the degree that basically your tools master you, they mean that you can't put your own meanings into the world. There I inevitably think of television. He goes on to say, Convivial tools are those which give each person who uses them the greatest opportunity to enrich the environment with the fruits of his or her vision. Again, you think of digital media there. Industrial tools deny this possibility to those who use them, and they allow their designers to determine the meaning and expectations of others. So there again, we think of television. William Morris, a century earlier, pitted against each other on the one hand, products made on an industrial scale for profit, or you could say, for mass audience, Versus things made on a human scale for pleasure and communication. People wanting to make their own meanings and share them with others. 
to think about their shared themes then. Morris stands for beauty, the human spirit, hope and ideas. And Ivan Illich is similar, but he's talking about tools which we can use to invest the world with our own meanings. Comparing media tools then, it's almost inevitable that television ends up down in that hole. It's not a tool that everyday people can use to share their vision and their ideas and their hopes and their dreams with others. Whereas on the more optimistic slope upwards, we might put YouTube up there, because it is a tool which does enable people to do that. Does this simply mean that television is bad and all digital media is good? No, of course not. Um, there's all kinds of digital media which don't enable people to really make their mark on the world, to stamp their own meanings and ideas and to shared media. One example I'm bound to think of, because we worked on a project about it, was the uh, Virtual World for Children, created by the BBC called Adventure Rock, which was a 3D virtual world for kids. Potentially very exciting. BBC management were excited to be putting out this innovative 3D virtual world for children. Because it sounds kind of cool. But it did not enable the young users to really make their mark on the world. They couldn't really change the world. They couldn't socialise in the world. They couldn't really be creative in that world. Except within a very fixed preset framework. Many computer games are like that, of course. They're not really intended to enable you to share your ideas, hopes and dreams with others. But that is the power of digital media which I really think we should embrace. So if this apple represents everyday creativity, well then these are the elements we're thinking about. There's those ideas from William Morris and Ivan Illich that I just talked about. There's the points about making with the hands and visual methods that I've talked about in other videos and which raise a challenge here because digital media often isn't about that real hands-on engagement with the world. There's the resurgence of craft and craft activism, craftivism, which I'll be mentioning in a moment, and of course Web 2.0, people's personal making and sharing activities. And then also we should consider happiness studies and social capital research, which I'm talking about next. The study of happiness is now quite well established within social science. It's quite measurable, you just ask people how happy they are. People are interestingly bad at predicting what will make them happy. People typically think that more money will make them happy. Studies show that's not really the case unless you're living in poverty. Things that are definitely good for happiness, the research shows, are community and social ties, meaningful work, having a project, and control over what you do. So it's all the kind of stuff I've been talking about already. The social capital research is kind of similar, but it centres on people being knitted into the fabric of communities rather than people as individuals. The growing research in social capital shows similar things, that what people need is social contact, networks, and doing things together as communities to really bind them together and make them actually work as a community. Where people are happy and are getting on, there's less crime, people are more healthy because they've got stuff to do. It's all positive stuff when social capital is established. I'm also connecting this with themes about craft and making, rather obviously people being engaged with their worlds and making things and sharing things in their worlds, not online or using Web 2.0, but in the real world as well. Guerrilla gardening always strikes me as a powerful metaphor for what happens when we take the principles of Web 2.0 and then we try to apply them in the real world. Then also craft and making and activism come together to make craftivism. It's a kind of newly emergent hybrid of both craft and activism, obviously, and it's a kind of hybrid of digital connections and real-world action. So if we take this apple of creativity and think about what the significance of all this is, well then I'd say it's about fostering creativity for the social good, enabling people to make their mark, which is good for their self-esteem. It's about people connecting and collaborating, which is good for social capital and the happiness of communities, and potentially gives us a link from media to real-world action, rather than from media to nothing but a bit of pleasurable enjoyment. Therefore, it's part of what I'm always talking about, hoping for a shift from a sit-back-and-be-told culture towards more of a making-and-doing culture. Thanks for watching this video. There's some links.